Hey, 42 here. Every Christmas, millions of Japanese people do something really rather surprising. They eat buckets and buckets of KFC. Which is particularly strange when you consider that, despite the prevalence of Christian wedding ceremonies in Japanese society, only 1% of the country is actually Christian. Christmas Day isn't even a national holiday. In fact, Japan has a notable, storied history of conflict with the Christian religion, with Jesuit missionaries in particular suffering severe persecution in the 17th century. The Tokunawa shogunate even went as far as to ban Christianity in 1620, considering it a threat to the nation. Japan remains overwhelmingly Shinto and Buddhist to this day. And yet, on the 25th of December each year, millions of Japanese people grab a bucket of Christmas chicken as their go-to meal. Demand is so high that orders are made months in advance, and queues for a table can be up to two hours long. Japan Airlines has even offered KFC as an in-flight meal during the holiday season. Japanese KFC stores have statues of Colonel Standers standing outside, white-haired and smiling, promising delicious fried chicken coated in 11 herbs and spices. Sometimes he's dressed as Santa, other times he's dressed as Goku from Dragon Ball Z, presumably summoning crispy strips from the Eternal Dragon. But why exactly do the Japanese deck their arteries with KFC cholesterol on Christmas Day each year? Well, for starters, a classic turkey dinner is out of the question, because turkey isn't typically eaten in Japan, and is therefore almost impossible to come by. But the real reason this tradition exists is thanks to one of the most successful marketing campaigns ever which launched nationwide in Japan in 1974. At the time, there was no established Christmas meal in Japan. Takeshi Akawa, manager of KFC Japan's very first store, had found himself a gap in the market. Like all the best entrepreneurs, he filled it with chicken. The campaign offered Christmas meals consisting of secret recipe chicken and wine, for 2,920 yen. It was called Carissimas Niwa Kentucky, meaning Kentucky for Christmas, and was backed up with endless salvos of commercials touting the catchphrase, Christmas equals Kentucky. Already experienced in adopting Western products and transforming them to suit their own needs, the Japanese were eager to take on the material side of Christmas, with its lights and Santa outfits, but without all that pesky connection to the nativity. Thanks to KFC's bottomless marketing bucket, I mean budget, the Son of God was swiftly replaced with a helping of fried chicken drumsticks, gravy and french fries. Maybe that's what he meant by man shall not live on bread alone. Interestingly enough, outside of Christmas, Japan KFC's busiest day is Mother's Day, because nothing says, thanks mum, like a Zynga stacker meal, obviously. These days, fast food is a truly global business. But it's perhaps in America that it's found its spiritual home. Americans consume some 50 billion burgers each year. Line them up side by side and you'll have created a tasty meat wall 800,000 miles long, enough to encircle the planet 32 times. What you'd actually do with such impressive meat-based fortifications is up for debate. Keeping out vegans, perhaps. Between 2013 and 2016, over one third of Americans could be found eating fast food on any given day, with the average American consuming around 100 kilograms of meat every year, the equivalent of around 2.4 burgers per day and spending over $100 every month on fast food. Whilst the good old US of A may be the modern day meat-based mecca, the global population's ravenous desire for quick, fatty, salty foods has made corporations all over the world billions. McDonald's and KFC both made over 20 billion US dollars in 2019, and their stores can be found in over 38,000 and 24,000 locations, respectively. 
Subway and Starbucks can both be found in over 30,000 locations apiece and are bringing in sums to rival the fried chicken and Happy Meal selling pioneers that came before them. But just how have these companies become so wildly successful? The food and drinks they serve are popular, sure, but plenty of restaurants around the world can say the same. No, the world's fast food titans attained their ubiquitous every street corner status not through their menus, but thanks to their business models. Fast food companies like McDonald's take advantage of franchising to make money. Essentially, the fast food company allows its franchises to generate income by selling their food and drink products, burgers and fries in the case of McDonald's. Some fast food companies make money directly from the sale of these products and others charge their franchisees rent to operate their branches. Of those 38,000 McDonald's stores I mentioned a second ago, over 36,000 of them are franchises, meaning McDonald's only operates around 7% of their branches. This is one of the reasons former McDonald's CFO Harry J. Sonborn said, we are not technically in the food business, we are in the real estate business. The success of this business model has seen fast food chains become one of the pillars of American entrepreneurship, which is why one of the most popular books on the subject, The E-Myth Revisited, devotes a good number of its pages to extolling the virtues of the franchise business model, using McDonald's as the example par excellence. Now, I'm not here to tell you how successful McDonald's is, or even how unhealthy fast food is, Let's be honest, you already know that it turns your organs into human foie gras. I'm here to tell you how these fast food companies came to dominate our diets and about the bizarre burger war that erupted between them all as they fought for food-based supremacy. Fast food has been with us longer than you'd think. Inns and taverns dishing out quick hot meals to travelers were found in both ancient Greece and Rome and a Han Dynasty text written between 25 to 205 AD tells us that noodle street food carts stayed open all night in China at the time. Medieval Europe provided ready-made meals such as pies and Chaucer's pilgrims each tell their stories in the hopes of winning a free hot meal at the Tabard Inn in the Canterbury Tales. Street food carts selling oysters harvested from the Hudson River's then 220,000 acres of oyster beds appeared in the 18th and 19th century New York, and in 1802, Thomas Jefferson ordered a meal at the White House that included potatoes served in the French manner, which is a posh way of saying French fries, in turn popularizing the snack in the US and no doubt securing his place on Mount Rushmore. But the transformation from convenience to fast food really began in 1872 with the birth of the Great American Diner. When Walter Scott began selling food from his horse-drawn carriage, it soon became popular to repurpose railway carriages as diners because they could be easily moved. In 1913, the first stationary adaptation was built, and they have largely retained their classic railcar styling ever since. But when a booming post-war economy catapulted the US into a new fast-paced era, there was a novel demand for all-hours restaurants with fast service and even faster food. Founded in 1921 by Billy Ingram and Walt Anderson, and considered America's first fast food burger chain. White Castle rose in popularity during the 40s. Oh, and yes, it is the very same fast food restaurant in which Harold and Kumar satiated their munchies in Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Conscious that burgers were seen as somehow dirty, thanks in part to Upton Sinclair's damning depiction of beef in his novel The Jungle, the White Castle creators went to great lengths to emphasize their cleanliness, displaying their pristine kitchens for all their customers to see. A strategy aped by fast food chains to this day. 
Everything was either bright white or stainless steel, with clear, easily understandable branding. This may seem commonplace now, but White Castle was the first restaurant to really nail it. Their basic burger, The Slider, was recently named by Time Magazine as the most influential burger of all time. Yeah, that's a thing. Because, simply put, it launched a burger into fast food superstardom and laid the foundations for the arrival of one Ronald McDonald himself. In 1948, two brothers, Dick and MacDonald, reinvented their burger restaurant based on what they called the speedy service system, with which they could serve customers fresh burgers, fries, and a shake in as little as 30 seconds. By 1963, they could do it in 15. To perfect the system, the brothers marked out the design for their kitchen in chalk on a tennis court, making the staff run burger creation drills until they discovered the most efficient layout. Coupled with the addition of the now famous Golden Arches, added by architect Stanley Clark Meston in 1953, the McDonald's brothers were well on their way to building something great. But a new, finger-licking good competitor was soon to appear on the horizon. Whilst companies like In-N-Out Burger would cement the drive through as an all-important mainstay in fast food restaurants, and Dunkin' Donuts and Taco Bell would present culinary alternatives to hamburgers, it was one Colonel Harland David Sanders who would make the largest splash. So named as an honorary Kentucky colonel, and not, in fact, a military man, Sanders had spent almost 20 years perfecting a secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices to season his chicken dishes. The colonel was a complex character, a foul-mouthed perfectionist. He once beat a man with a chair and is said to have attempted to kidnap his own children but he's also known to have given generously to charity and was deeply religious. He even believed God had healed his colon polyp. But none of that is the reason he's still so famous today. That's because he discovered one of the greatest tastes in the known universe, KFC. But it wasn't Sanders' secret recipe that changed everything. Like McDonald's, it was his ability to franchise the recipe and his own image the Chicken Man, however, began franchising three years before McD's in 1952, opening the first such branch in Salt Lake City. Sanders travelled the nation and sold his recipe to restaurants under the condition they give him four cents for every chicken sold. His recipe and image soon took the USA by storm. The first such franchisee, Pete Harmon, had the genius idea of naming his restaurant Kentucky Fried Chicken, and even coined the iconic catchphrase, it's finger licking good. When salesman Ray Kroc arrived on the scene in 1954, and having visited a multitude of restaurants in his time, was convinced the McDonald's brothers had the best, most efficient he'd ever seen. Taking the franchise countrywide in 55, Croc insisted on cleanliness, identical menus, friendly staff, no cigarette or pinball machines, and zero waste, to the point where used sauce containers were scraped clean before being disposed of. In 1961, Croc bought the McDonald's company from its founders. KFC, McDonald's, and soon Wendy's and Burger King grew into massive franchises, with each finding new ways of seizing more of the market. During the 60s and 70s, for instance, McDonald's saw success advertising to children by introducing the Happy Meal and characters like the Hamburglar and the notorious sociopath Ronald McDonald with his terrifying blood-smeared grin. <coughs> These efforts to corner a greater share of the market ushered in one of the most important periods in fast food history, a time that truly captured how effectively and bizarrely these companies fought for a place in the public imagination and appetite. We humans have a bad habit of going to war. There was the Great War, World War II, the Vietnam War, and the Iraq War. 
there's even been a war over a stray dog. But none of these quite compare to the lunacy of the Burger Wars. During the 1980s and 90s, the fast food giants found themselves in a tricky situation. Each needed to increase revenues, but each was serving a consumer that wanted the same thing, familiarity. A burger, fries, maybe some fried chicken. In the fast food industry, particularly in those days, there wasn't much room for creativity. You don't want caviar on your McMuffin. You want to be certain you're going to receive something predictably delicious. For McDonald's, who had been serving the same thing for so long it had become the gold standard, this wasn't a huge issue. But for their competitors, they had to find other ways to differentiate themselves, all whilst selling what was pretty much the exact same product. So what did they do? Well, they got a little childish. Big budget, high profile TV adverts, on-site campaigns and press releases all took advantage of a sneaky tactic called comparative marketing. Unfavorably comparing rival products to their own. A classic example is the image of a Burger King Whopper spilling over the sides of a red box with the text below reading, silly Whopper, that's a Big Mac box. The message was clear. Burger King's burgers were bigger than McDonald's largest offering. Wendy's, in an effort to distinguish their burgers as being made from 100% beef, released Where's the Beef campaigns, with old ladies sitting on giant sesame seed buns, highlighting their rival's lack of good quality meat. On-site campaigns went even further, with billboards appearing outside competitor restaurants admonishing the consumer for choosing such an inferior product. The downside of this aggressive marketing strategy was that it cost a fortune. In the 80s, due to constant marketing spending, Burger King had to lay off a large number of staff, and Wendy's reported its first ever quarterly loss. McDonald's, meanwhile, ever the unstoppable giant of fast food, continued to grow in profits and market share. I guess you could say they were loving it. One especially odd strategy employed by Burger King was the $40 million Where's Herb campaign. The premise was simple. A fictional man named Herb was said to have never eaten at a Burger King before. Fans were called on to visit Burger King restaurants and report any sightings of Herb in order to win a $5,000 prize. For a while, things went pretty well and Herb briefly became the most famous man in America. But then things took a bizarre turn. Herb, played by actor John Menick, somehow ended up refereeing a WWF match between Roddy Piper and Mr. T alongside the old woman from the Wendy's Where's the Beef commercial who was acting as timekeeper. Not long after, an 11 year old boy managed to spot Herb in a Burger King in Newark. But due to his age, the $5,000 prize money was awarded to his friend instead. Outraged, and this is not a joke, the boy's parents brought the issue before the state senate, who condemned the decision as consumer fraud. It's fair to say the campaign was not a great success. Burger King's profits fell by 40%, and the ad agency responsible was fired. Wendy's made the most of their rival's misfortune though, running their own campaign in which they claimed Herb wasn't hiding at all. He was simply eating at their restaurants. Whilst this whole marketing maelstrom had its fair share of failures amongst the successes, it succeeded in further catapulting the fast food giants and their rivalry into the forefront of American culture. These companies were popping up everywhere. On television, in movies, on billboards, on the radio. They were even outside each other's restaurants. Fast food was receiving more exposure than ever before, and thus, more normalization. And it kept going and going and going. Burger King introduced a new burger called The Big King, which was little more than a Big Mac ripoff. 
Television ads boldly declared it was better than the original in every way. McDonald's released a new product called the Arch Deluxe and packed it up with a $100 million marketing campaign. Sadly, nobody wanted it. To re-strategize, they recruited marketing royalty like Tom Ryan, mastermind behind Pizza Hut's stuffed crust phenomenon, who came on board to streamline the company's menu. Meanwhile, Burger King invested four years of R&D efforts and over $70 million in advertising to unveil their new french fry, a masterpiece of fried potato they sold as the taste that beats McDonald's. Not to be outdone, McDonald's struck back before the new french fry was even unveiled. Buying airtime during the Academy Awards, McDonald's ran an ad that held a close-up of the new Burger King fries. But as the camera pulls back, the audience realized the fries were being filmed as part of a product shoot and the entire staff was busy snacking on McDonald's fries. The kicker? The advert was set to The Great Pretender by The Platters. Ouch. This is the point where the Mortal Kombat announcer would usually shout, Finish him! But the Burger Wars continued. In 2015, Burger King actually attempted to call for a ceasefire when, on the International Day of Peace, they asked McDonald's to join them in a joint McWhopper promotion. Sadly, McDonald's declined, a decision that was widely decried, even by President Barack Obama. That's right, the President of the United States himself got involved in the Burger Wars. And much like our desire for fast food, the Burger Wars are showing no signs of abating anytime soon. Ah, hang on, my delivery just arrived and that burger isn't going to eat itself. Time to turn my organs into human foie gras. Thanks for watching. What's that I hear you say? You want to experience my new book, stick a flag in it, but you can't be asked to read. I hear you. That's why you can now get the audiobook release of Sticker Flag in It over on Audible. You'll find the link in the description below. Thank you.